Good evening. Today is uh, the regularly scheduled school board business meeting for April 12, 2005. If you would all rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, <laughs> next item on the agenda is adjustments to agenda. I know we have one, and that is uh, under new business, Bob. We um, actually have three. Um, okay. There is an addendum up back if people in the audience um, wish to, to get a copy. Um, and I'll pass those out for board members. Um, the, there is a 12A, an addition is being made to the already existing 12A recommending an, an athletic fee position. There's an added item, consideration of the request to determine the composition of the Substance Abuse Policy Review Committee, and another item, consideration of the superintendent's recommendation on to fill a co-curricular fee position. And there's backup material with the addendum. Well, that covers the one I knew about for sure. Are there any other uh, adjustments to the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on. Item number four, um, comments from Pond Cove, principal of the day has been deferred until May. So we'll move on to comments from our high school representatives. So it's spring at the high school, which means spring sports. Um, our sports are tennis, which is coming off a really great season last year, uh, undefeated, uh, looking to have another good season this year, even with the loss of Sam Mowry. And uh, later in the year, uh, most of the varsity players and some of the JV players will be going on a trip with the team to Hilton Head, where <coughs> for a couple weeks or a week, uh, they play there and uh, stay there and take lessons, and so that should be good for them. Uh, lacrosse, obviously, is starting up. Uh, notoriously a really good lacrosse school, so everyone's really excited about lacrosse season. Uh, track and baseball and softball are back. We're state champions in baseball last year, so it should be a good season. Uh, also starting this spring is the annual spring musical. So you have chosen to do Damn Yankees. Uh, performance is going to be May 26th, 27th, 28th, and June 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. <coughs> and uh, rehearsals have already started. We're looking forward to putting on a very professional quality piece of work. Um, recently we had Spring Fest, which was kind of a a way to welcome in spring in the high school and kind of boost morale, coupled with the uh, winter moving out, spring coming in. Um, so we had a bunch of different inter-class activities in school and after school, and uh, the different classes got points, and then it was kind of like a competition, but it was a lot of fun. Some of the activities, there was a 3v3 roller hockey tournament on tennis courts, uh, 3v3 basketball, um, competition in the gym. There was a big pep rally uh, where there was a ping pong championship. Uh, there was a staff versus students basketball game where they wore mittens and socks, which is always fun. Um, there was a hall decorating competition. And so that did a lot to kind of boost morale as spring came in and it was a lot of fun. I think everyone enjoyed it. And, uh, also, it has been decided that the seniors will have the senior transition project this year, starting on May 16th. Uh, myself and the rest of the seniors will be leaving for three weeks to go intern and volunteer at various locations, hopes of uh, gaining some knowledge about what it's like to work at a place in the real world. And we're all looking forward to it. Only 18 days of classes left, so it should be a lot of fun. <laughs> Not that you're counting. <laughs> Um, and another thing that's been happening recently, we had uh, the French and Spanish plays in school. 
where the uh, French Five and Spanish Five classes put together uh, plays about the school. They're usually pretty funny. They mock a lot of the teachers and things that are going along in the school. Um, and the Spanish one was today, the French one was a little while ago, and that's uh, always a lot of fun. Even if you don't speak the language, you can <laughs> usually get it. So, been a lot of fun things happening. Uh, I heard a rumor that the uh, sophomore class pulled the faculty into the mud pit in the tug of war. Is, is that accurate? Um, I actually didn't see that. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> I think they got revenge. I wish but... I had seen that. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just make a comment um, about the high school? I just wanted to make sure that there was some recognition for um, one of the classes um, at the high school, Ted Jordan's AP government class. Um, held an, uh, a dinner and a silent auction to raise money for Camp Sunshine. And um, I believe they raised about $3,100 um, for Camp Sunshine last Saturday night. So I wanted to thank them for the good work and the lessons they learned along the way. Before we move on to the middle school, I. Um apparently forgot to seek approval of uh, the March school board meeting minutes. Um, and I have a motion to <clears throat> accept the minutes as rendered. We actually have four sets of minutes, and there are a couple of corrections, if I could quickly. Um, the regular meeting for March, the uh, March 8th meeting, is, I think is fine. The March 21st special meeting is fine. The March 22nd morning special meeting um, needs to have the date corrected at the top because it's listed as a March 21st on the, on the date that uh, it comes down to. And then um, we had a March 22nd evening special meeting um, after our workshop, which I think the minutes are fine as well. So I, the only correction I know about is the uh, morning session, which was actually the, the, the uh, discussion about the superintendent candidates, and that just has a date uh, error in it. So, you know, I would recommend that you amend that, and uh, the others are fine. Any other adjustments or amendments, Kathy? The um, regular meeting minutes from our last school board meeting, um, when under the section of policy, second <coughs> reading, um, policy BCC nepotism, it says that there was no change recommended when um, that policy was not reviewed that time, and I'd like it to make change to indicate that it was not reviewed. Okay. Noted. Thank you. Any other adjustments, amendments? Seeing none, can I have a motion to accept the adopted, uh, the amended minutes? Thank you, Elaine, a second. Trish, thank you. All in favor? 7-0. And now, the middle school. Hi, I'm Elsa Mullen, nor can be here today. Um, the Cape Elizabeth Middle School is in the middle of the third and last trimester. For the past week or so, the school has been raising money by the school's annual magazine sale where 40% of the money goes uh, directly to the school. The last turn-in day is this Friday, and we are well over half of the way to our goal of 1,000 sales. Also, the middle school's second play this year, Bugsy Malone Jr., um, is um, um, finished up with shows on Friday and, and over last weekend. Mr. Sillinger directed it, and it was a wonderful performance. Last uh, week, we had a half day, and it was a community day. The seventh grade had a Hawaiian tropical theme and everyone dressed up. The eighth graders focused on later years. They made a video of everyone saying a quick segment about their favorite eighth uh, middle school memory. And also uh, they wrote a letter to themselves that they would get back in um, high school. And also everyone put in a small like object uh, to remember for, as an example, um, a Live Strong bracelet. Um, and in, eighth, in 12th grade, they will get it back and can remember middle school. 
Spring sports has started this week. Uh, lacrosse, baseball, softball, softball, and outdoor track started on Monday or today. The fifth and sixth graders had a social last week, and the seventh and eighth graders are having a dance in a few weeks. The fifth graders have started a um, pedometer program called Maine in Motion, directed by Governor's Council of Physical Fitness. Every child in the grade is given a pedometer and are told to write their steps taken in a day. And over uh, eight weeks, they try to increase it. The eighth graders have voted today on their eighth grade class gift. Some choices were a bench, playground equipment, banners, and plants and flyers. Some things for the eighth grade to be thinking about are eighth grade recognition night on June 9th, step day on June 16th, an award and beach day on June 17th. And for everyone, April vacation is coming next week. Thank you. I didn't get your name. I'm Elsa Mullen. Elsa, thank, thank you, you so very much. I have a question. Okay. I heard you say indoor track. Or outdoor track. Outdoor, tra outdoor track. Does that mean I can come to the middle school in the afternoon without a rear view mirror? <laughs> <laughs> And I just wanted to comment, I went to the play and I thought it was great. The kids did a great job and I really want to applaud their efforts and the efforts of the staff that participated to make that happen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. On to communications, Bob. Yes, um, in your packet was a notification for a school golf for board members um, workshop by Drummond Woodsum. Um, just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, there was also a letter in your packet following that um, regarding um, a parent who was very pleased with the high school um, staff and uh, what her daughter had, had um, um, gotten from, from her high school experience, and it's always nice to get letters like that, and uh, uh, we have a great staff, and it's really nice to, to see those congratulations. Um, in your packet, there's also a copy of the teachers eligible for continuing contract status and teachers eligible for uh, second year probationary status for next year. There is one um, uh, one change to be made in that. Um, the front page, teachers eligible for continuing contract status is accurate as it's printed. Um, on the second page, under system wide at the bottom, um, you'll notice that the, exactly the same names were repeated. Um, that was a mistake. Um, they should be crossed out. And uh, Mary Jane Call the school psychologist would be the one person who would be should be listed under system wide for second year probationary contracts. We will be acting on those next month, and we try to give you those a month ahead so that you have them and know that the, that's coming. Bob, yes, there's another uh, error of omission on okay. the uh, teachers going on to eligible for continuing contract. Beth mm -hmm. Milroy should be added under high school special ed. For second year, we should have Karen Cohn and Deb Candy. They're both system wide. System wide. Teacher Karen Cohn and Teacher Deb. It's just a matter of business. We will update. Yeah. We'll, I'll send you an update on this. We'll update it. We'll and make sure it's right before our next meeting. Thank you. Um, back on communications with the school law workshop, I would particularly urge our newest members, if not all of our members, to try and make arrangements to attend that. It's uh, extraordinarily good information to have. The one other piece that I have, Kevin, that's an addition, is um, that we did receive um, just today or late yesterday the um, Town of Cape Elizabeth financial benchmarks that they put out. I guess this is not the first year that they've done it. Let's hold it until the end of the meeting. Okay. No, go ahead. Finish your No, comments. and it was simply um, wanted people to have copies. Um, uh, as, I don't think I need to remind you we're meeting with the town council tomorrow night, and uh, this is one piece of information that they just put out to the town councilors. Great. Please remember to grab your uh, book. Um, 
before you leave for the evening. Uh, I agenda item number six, comments from the public on non-agenda items. Do we have anyone here? Okay, number seven, recognition, Bob. We, will, um, we are putting together a list of students from the year to be recognized. Um, uh, that's, we, there's always, I guess, been a question about when does town council recognize people and when does the school committee recognize people. Um, we've decided that we would like to have a list of students who have, have um, achieved in some way um, for recognition beyond the school level. If it's at the school level, we recognize in the school. But if it's beyond the school level, if it's the uh, um, county or the state or the um, conference levels for sports and for other things, then we should certainly at least be naming those students and, and uh, um, letting them know we, we care about their performance. So we will be trying to do put that together for next month. Thank you, Bob. Anything else? Seeing nothing, uh, number eight, superintendent's report, Bob. Yes. Um, we have, uh, first is update on budget progress. We have been working on questions that have been coming from the town council about our budget. Um, there is a draft out for the school board um, that we will be um, needing your input on prior to getting that to the council tomorrow morning. Um, and we will be meeting with them tomorrow evening. So um, that is a 7.30 meeting right here in this room as far as I know. Kathy, is that yes, accurate? that's right. Okay. Um, two receipts of grants. One is um, there was a, a notice in your package um, about the um, Pond Cove Parents Association grant. And Trish, would you like to talk about that? I didn't ask you ahead of time, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. The, the money has been raised um, by parents over the past couple years, um, group, uh, great parents. Um, and there, we worked, I think the PCPA worked closely with the administration um, and the teachers in figuring out how best to distribute um, the $26,000 that was actually awarded so that the whole school could benefit. Um, and I think Tom can add to this, but um, the, they surveyed the staff and um, spent quite a bit of several months determining where best it could be used. A lot of it seems is going at this point towards technology. Um, actually, the money is distributed through all, allied arts and through all the grade levels um, to technology and um, literacy programs, um, books, wireless computers, laptops, um, and allied art. So I think it's, um, it, it, the students will greatly benefit from the money and it was thought, it was very a thoughtful process as to where it should best be dispensed and could be best used. Please add, Tom. Can I add? Those are the facts and it was a wonderful conclusion, but the, the process this year was new. The PCPA has always been very generous with awarding grants to individuals and to classes. But um, this year, they initiated um, a school-wide survey of our needs and priorities looking toward the future and combed through the survey, reported back to us, we took a look out of it, and then issued to us a very healthy challenge. Suppose we targeted the money for you, what do you want for the whole school? Uh, before we could just take the amount of money and divide by number of teams. So this went back and forth among teams and a faculty meeting, what do we really need? So technology emerged, but it wasn't until uh, it happens to be actually to take greater advantage of a PCPA gift from a few years ago to better use and update the uh, mobile app. There was some discussion about, oh, that's only for third and fourth grade. And then a uh, primary teacher said, but, but I think my kids will be in third and fourth grade one of these days. We realized then it was technology as a tool, not just the um, airports and the updated laptops 
and that got us to thinking uh, literacy. So it was technology oriented for the older kids, but it's books and mentor texts and other things for the lower grades. But I just want to compliment PCPA, not only for the incredible generosity, we had been thinking maybe best case sixteen to $20,000. So Kelly and I went to the PCPA meeting with that in mind. And because of the uh, exchange and interchange, PCPA somehow, creative bookkeeping, came up with $26,000. So we're overwhelmed, not just with the content, but that kind of sophisticated support for the school. It, it's just overwhelming for us. We can't thank people enough. And as the uh, high school students meant to uh, what a shot in the arm for school climate. And the check, if you haven't seen it, the check is rather large. Looks like one in size, but not the amount that Tiger Woods would get. It's one of these. It's eight feet long, about four feet high. Just, it was just a terrific thing to do. Thanks, Tom. Um, there was also another grant that was awarded, and that was from the United Parcel Service for $10,910 um, to the Cape Elizabeth High School Literacy and Senior Citizen Projects. Um, the purpose of the grant is really to bring theater programs, and it was to the theater group that it came, and to bring those programs to senior citizens and young children to continue their outreach program that they've already started. And so that's great to see those kinds of things happening. Yes. On behalf of the board, I would like to extend our appreciation to both the Pine Cove Parents Association and United Parcel Service for their extraordinarily generous grants uh, to the schools. Thanks, Kevin. Um, the, next, uh, the next edition of The View is due to come out in mid-May. Um, deadline is April 26th, which is not long after April vacation, and that's coming right up. So I urge board members and uh, staff members to uh, um, and parents, if they have things to uh, contribute, to please get them into the uh, central office. Um, local assessment system. I have told you for a while that we've been working on the local assessment system and you've been dealing with many different pieces um, that um, the early, the late starts, the all the pieces that make it work. Um, Sarah has put together for each of you a package of materials, not to be read tonight, not to be discussed tonight, but just to give you an idea of what that <coughs> is involved in that local assessment, assessment system at this time. And I'll put those right with the, uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth financial benchmarks, and, and we'll make sure you get them at the end of the evening. There's one more piece of information, and that is from um, uh, Maine School Management on the um, issue of negotiating education policy. That's been an issue. It's uh, coming up again. There are two bills in the legislature right now to deal with that, and it's more information about that and what it would mean for school boards. So um, that's another piece that we have for you um, to hand out tonight for future reading. In your packet, there was also a letter from Ted Jordan or an, an email from Ted Jordan about the trip to Washington. Um, I, I, I just highlight it because uh, it, it sounds like a trip that, that I would have loved to have been on. Um, just some great stuff there and um, wanted to make sure that you knew that it was in there. Um, we also had in your packet an invitation to Cape Elizabeth High School to participate in Improving School Symposium. And they only invited uh, the top 25 schools in the state to participate in that. Um, that um, is being held um, right now, and I don't know whether we participated or not, but the important thing is that they recognize that we were in that category and, and should have been in that category. So um, congratulations to Jeff and the high school for, for all their work to be in that status. Um, I've talked with, I'm, or I've emailed um, back and forth with Alan Hawkins and our, your next superintendent, and he will be uh, coming here May 4th um, to spend about an hour and a half with me before he goes to another meeting, um, planning out uh, the att his attendance at certain meetings as we get down toward the end of the year. Um, and so if you have thoughts on things that he should definitely 
try to include in his schedule, <coughs> please let me know. Um, we want to make sure that he gets as uh, familiar with the district as he can. It's really tough to do over the summer. It's much easier to do as um, activities are still going on. And he would like to have been at our meeting tomorrow night with the town council, but has let me know that he is not going to be able to make it because he has his own budget hearing tomorrow night as well. Um, just uh, an information item for the school board. Um, all of the administration evaluations are done now. Um, they are in the office, and you are welcome to come in to review them if you'd like to. Um, those are done by me to the administrative staff, the members of the DLT, and um, if you have questions about them or concerns about them, please talk to me. Um, but they are there, and I want you to know that they are available for you to review if you would like to do that and we'll keep them available for the next two weeks or so before we put them in their files, actually. Um, construction update. I'm not going to uh, do it myself because we had three members of the board who took the tour of the high school um, this week. And uh, since Elaine is the chair of the building committee, Elaine, would you like to just talk about where we are in, the, in that project? Sure. Um is it last Thursday? Last Thursday? Um, so sometime last week. <laughs> um, there were several members of the school board uh, along with um, uh, Jeff Shedd and, and Bob Lyman and the uh, construction, not the construction manager, the foreman of the job mm -hmm. who took us around the schools to see the status of the construction. We were um, what used to be the front offices has been completely gutted and uh, sealed off and will be um, reconfigured to accommodate an expanded guidance office and some more space uh, in the nurse's office and in the front offices in the south. Um, we also were able to take a tour of the newly opened locker rooms um, and saw um, the great job that they had done there really um, changing that space again, reconfiguring it, updating all the fixtures, retiling, um, but it'll be a great place for our athletes and I hopefully well worth their wait. Um, we appreciate their patience on that. Um, see the front office had moved down to near the cafeteria, the cap temporarily, and the cafeteria uh, sometime over this vacation is scheduled to have the addition opened up to the old portion of the cafeteria so that they'll be bringing some light into that area. The ceiling has been replaced um, and um, it'll be a, a really nice space for not only uh, lunch for our high schoolers and give them seats to sit in, but also for the community to use afterwards. Um, we saw some special ed space that, be, had, that had been finished and I know that over the summer there will be a lot of site work that the community <laughs> will see um, between the parking uh, lots and the, the entranceways. And uh, lastly, the science labs and will be worked on this summer. And um, some work down on the auditorium, music, and IT wing will occur uh, from the late summer into the fall, I believe, is what we were told. But it is on schedule. It's about... Uh, did you say a third of the way done? No, nope. it's just about halfway yeah. done, and it's um, slightly ahead of schedule, not a lot. Some people like Keith are moving uh, this very week, and uh, um, others are, are being shifted as we speak because that's where we are in this project. It's, it's a, um, a situation where you you know, do one section, you move people out of it so that you can do it, you move people <laughs> back into that section, and then you go to uh, another section. And that's what renovation is when you're trying to keep the high school moving. I have to give uh, Jeff just a huge amount of credit for keeping everything uh, uh, running smoothly because, um, we, you know, when the, we first began the year and the jackhammers started going at the same time that people were trying to teach, it just wasn't going to work. and. So we quickly had some meetings and got things uh, settled down as to when they could do what types of, of work. And um, I think uh, the, the group that took the tour actually heard the work going down 
uh, in the bathrooms, but that was only disturbing the cafeteria, so it wasn't too bad. Um, but it has been a, a, a major job to keep everything up and running. I was really impressed with, with the, the teachers and the students just pretty much going about their business. I mean, you had you could see the remnants of the, the reconstruction and hanging wires and construction workers uh, being around the students, but everybody seemed to be very accommodating. They weren't phased at all, and so for that, you know, we're, we should be really thankful that it, it's gone so well in that regard. So, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, the last thing I have is an update on the uh, middle school principal search. And this is a, a press release that we put out today. The Cape Elizabeth Middle School Principal Search Committee is pleased to announce the narrowing of the candidate field to two finalists. The two are Stephen B. Conley of South Portland, Maine, and Dennis J. Duquette of Raymond, Maine. Stephen is currently assistant principal of Portland High School, and Dennis is principal of Gorham Middle School. Each candidate will be spending part of a day this week at Cape Elizabeth Middle School, Dennis on Thursday and Stephen on Friday. The meeting schedule for each will be 11 to 12.30, lunch, questions and discussion with different teacher groups, 12.45 to 1.30, questions and discussions with student council representatives, and 1.45 to 2.30, questions and discussions with parents and the public. Anyone wishing to participate should sign in at the school office and get directions from there. The committee is hoping to have a recommendation for this position to be present, uh, presented to the school board shortly after next week's April vacation. Unless there are questions, that's, what I, that's all I have. Any questions? And we will move on to uh, school reports, the first being a middle school program report. Got to set up this technology. <laughs> to me, this is scary. Be careful, I'm afraid you know. Oh, I can go right. I don't see a right now. Like, thing, this thing. Um, I'm Sarah Kinsella, and I'm with Andy Strout, and we're representing the Middle School of Physical Education Department here. Um, and what we're doing is we are using um, what we just were trained in. I'm sure Nancy will be very happy to see that we've already taken inspiration um, and we're using it, using it wisely here. So we're going to do a little, little demonstration of inspiration and what we're doing um, in phys ed during the winters, um, which we think most people would like to know because the winters are dark and dreary and and uh, we're inside and outside throughout the winter doing all kinds of different activities with the kids. So this is winters in middle school physical education class. I already, I already messed up. All right, we'll go. With it. Um, the first um, area that we were, going to, we were going to talk about, the outdoor activities. And there are three um, activities that we attempt to do every winter outside. Um, of course, we work with the weather, which isn't always cooperative, so that can be a problem. Um, this year, we didn't get outside um, at all, unfortunately, but it is something we try to do. Um, in the wintertime, we also have uh, MEAs that fall in there, and with assessments, it just it doesn't always work out for us. So we, we, we try, but we do our best. Most, most of the time, we get out there. Um, capture the flag in the snow is, is one of the ones the kids absolutely love. Um, it's an age-old game, and we get out there, and the more space, the better for them. And playing in the snow, as long as it's soft and safe, um, they have a great time with that. We also try to get out and do some sledding, um, which is, is actually very good um, physical activity. Um, lugging their sleds up and down that hill and all those warm clothes really um, is, is good to watch. But uh, this year, the construction actually caused a little bit of a problem with our hill. But um, that's another one the kids love. Um, and the last one would be the cross-country skiing. We have a, a, a lot of cross-country skis that have been donated to us from different families. And um, when we can, we get out there and we, we give them a course around the school and take them cross-country skiing. The next one, next one is the uh, circuit 
uh, station training that we do each year within the gym. And we, we really try and teach the kids a lot about muscle strength and endurance, flexibility, and the cardio, it's a cardiovascular endurance. Tell what just learned. <laughs> uh, with the cardiovascular, what we do is we set up stations for the kids. Um, and we have a stationary bike station, a treadmill. Um, we have a jogging station where they just do some jogging around the gym. And we have a jump rope station. Um, they do each one for about three minutes and then they rotate. Um, flexibility, we have a stretching station and we have a sit and reach um, station, which is actually where they are allowed to practice um, one of the physical fitness tests that we give them during the year. <laughs> it's getting crowded. Yeah. <laughs> um, for muscle strength and endurance, we have um, curl ups. They have a station where they can practice their curl ups. That's another one we test them on during the year. Um, we have a couple of stair steppers they're allowed to use, some rowing machines, um, the rings, which are extremely popular, um, and some of them are pretty talented on those as well. Uh, we also have climbing ropes, and we allow the kids to put a little magnet up on the bars when they get up to the top, if, they're, if they can, if they're capable of climbing to the top of the ropes, so that's a big feature. Uh, the pegboard or the climbing wall, those are two um, upper arm strength um, areas where they, they basically climb the wall with their arms and, um, and pull-ups. And the curl-ups, I'm sorry, or curl-ups are abdominal, obviously. Uh, presidential uh, Physical Fitness Awards, this is, um, we have five areas that we test the kids on throughout the year, um, and those you can see are pull-ups, curl-ups, sit and reach, shuttle run, and the mile run or walk. Um, Pull-ups, I already said, those are upper body strength and endurance. The kids get um, one minute to do as many as they can, and we record how they do. Um, Curl-ups are abdominal strength and endurance, and they have, again, one minute to do as many as they can. Uh, sit and reach um, is, is the flexibility boxes where they sit and record how far they can reach beyond their toes. Uh, the shuttle run is speed and agility, and um, basically it's, it's a quick sprint that they do, um, picking up blocks and returning them to the starting line, and we time them. And the mile run walk is uh, we take them right down to the high school track, and they have to do four laps um, the best that they can. Do this one? Yeah. This is a confusing one here. <coughs> like something brand new for us. Uh, this is another part of the Presidential uh, Champions Program. It's part of the Presidential Physical Fitness Awards Program, which actually in the past six years we've been the, the state champs um, based on schools our, our size. We've been able to accumulate enough children who have um, exceeded the 85th percentile. Um, and and uh, so that's compared to everyone else within the country. And then it comes back to compare us within the schools in, in Maine. And we've won that state championship for the last six years. We've always looked at, at this as something that uh, is great for the best of athletes. But what about the kids that do the dance? What about the kids who horseback ride? do all those other little things and aren't the, the most talented athletes. So we looked into uh, what's called the Presidential Champions Program. And it, it lines right up with our, with our laptops because there's one that's called the Presidential Online Program. And um, it does, it tracks your activity, uh, it makes you get active, uh, you get to choose an activity that you're, you like doing. Um, and you get awards, and you're awarded certain point values for um, participating in these. And the awards go from silver, bronze, and gold uh, awards, depending on um, points. And the point system is based on the activity, how much activity you actually do, how long you do that. And we do have an example of, of how that works for you. So um, I'll run that through, and Sarah, you can talk us through it. Okay, he's going to take us to the website. Um, and basically, the, the kids have been taught how to do this. We've got them all in. They all have their own passwords. They know how to get in. 
and um, chart their activities. So once they get in, they enter their username. And we found that really a lot of the kids that come to phys ed and maybe it's not their favorite of allied arts um, have really gotten involved in this. <laughs> well, this is all seventh, just seventh and eighth grade. Um, <laughs> One more time. If they can't get in, we just make them do sprints. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 Somebody wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I started watching me. Yeah, yeah, the server may be down. Well, it can't be down because... Uh, uh, well, we can, I mean, I, I can run you through it anyways. Basically, if we, if we could get in, um, there, there's a screen. It's, it's similar to this, and it shows them um, a list of activities. They can make their own favorites list if they do certain activities more often than others. Um, or they can choose, basically, they range from household chores to, um, to uh, you know, football. Um, walking, um, they have child games as in, you know, some of the kids going out and playing tag with their friends, um, shooting around in the yard. Whatever activity that they do, they can find some category where it fits under. And depending on the category, they, once they've picked that, then they can um, pick what kind of level activity it was, whether it was moderate, uh, mild, or uh, vigorous. So here's an example of one student, uh, Meredith Riker, who I got all her paperwork so I could put her up here, and she was all excited about it. But here's, here's a student that has almost um, 100,000 points. Uh, and she is just someone, as you can see, she plays volleyball, soccer, swimming. She does all this she's dancing. She goes to the dances and gets points for that. Uh, and you can just see the multitude of points that she has accumulated throughout the year. And this is someone who probably goes on this once a week and can accumulate all these different points. So right now she's a silver medalist uh, that she will receive her silver, silver medal at the end of the year. This is also part of the, the, uh, the Education Foundation gave us a grant for this a couple of years ago where we've got pedometers and heart monitors and now it's just playing off. Uh, we were able to get onto this and use a lot of this equipment. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been fabulous to sit here and look at all these things that this, this girl has done. Well, she's an athlete. She's a great athlete. So this is great for her. But when it comes, we have, uh, I have another example of another student who is not um, the so-called big, the, the great athlete, but does a lot of things. He might do household chores. He might help build a little house um, in the backyard. Like fix something in the house. And you get points for all those things. And here you can just see all these are all the people in one class, and all of the all the points that people have gotten. Um, and uh, I gotta get out of here so I can go find uh, the eighth grader, which won't take me as long because the server was in my head that went down. <laughs> and Gary got mad at me for writing all these all these little notes on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> so this is another, another class here, and I, I can monitor exactly where, what they're doing, how many points they're accumulating, uh, and we kind, of, we kind of, you know, jog their memories to use it a little bit for some of them, but most of them, they just love it, and they come to our study halls if they have problems, and, and we can help them figure it all out. Now here's someone who does table tennis, table tennis, calisthenics, children's games. If they, if they have a little kid at home and they do little children's games with them, they can accumulate points. No, you don't get a heck of a lot of points from it. But here's someone that walking, points for walking, cross-country skiing, um, you know, golf, children's games again, archery. So it, you don't have to, you don't see the big soccer, the basketball game, and all those things. 
for this person here. So it's important to, to show that even these guys, we're trying to target them and pat them on the back for doing the little things that uh, puts them up to a, a certain level. What you find, too, is that a lot of the kids who end up with the 85 percentile in all five of the physical fitness testing are the, typically are the kids that are doing an awful lot of athletics, and that's just, that's, you know, expected. But what happens with this, it's great, is that the kids who aren't in all the organized sports, but they're still active, they still can get the awards um, in another form, which is motivating for them. Uh, and we have the whole presentation for you that we'll hand out to you also. Are there any questions? That's what middle school is all about. <laughs> I just wondered with the, kind of the focus right now nationally on you know, health and nutrition and concern with so much obesity and um, you know, physical activity, are you seeing that there are trends that are kind of coming down the pike for middle school um, programs? I mean, are, are you sort of looking ahead to well, th this is one of the changes because we want to key in on the people that aren't as active. But actually, Maine came out to be seventh in the nation in the most active, the most physically fit state across, across the country. Um, but we do have a, a child obesity, and that is on the lower end. So, you know, it's kind of conflicting. And then we look at our percentage rates of kids that are actually active in, in sports and everything, and we're we're way up there. I, I look at um, this, this year in baseball, we have 50, 50 kids in baseball in the middle school, uh, 45, 50 kids in, in lacrosse, and you know, the kids are just very, very active. And this shows it right here, too. Um, we probably had um, probably, I'd say, 10% of all the kids that, that are involved in this were below what we, we, what we had hoped that they would be at. And that's just because couldn't get in on my password, and they didn't come and, and see us. I, we have people that have just sheets of paper and showing us the sheets of paper and not logging in because they couldn't get in. But we do find that everyone's very active, and, and I haven't seen anything that shows that they're not as active as they, as they have in the past. Are all the students enrolled in the um, online presidential campaign? S seventh and eighth grade. All. Okay. There, there are a few that, uh, that never, there are a couple of new kids that came in and wished that they had gotten involved in the program. We, we do have some of the special needs kids that uh, we have gotten them online, and that, it's kind of neat because a couple of them with, their, with, with the teacher who's assisting them, um, they sit down and, and uh, really play with that and see what type of uh, activities that they like to do and things. They're all right there for them. There's a big, long list of probably 75 to 100 activities that the kids can be involved in to accumulate points. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you both. Tom? I have a principal's report. Hello again. Uh, because of the new rotating format, I haven't been up here in a few months, so I have to return. Probably easy to remind you tonight, the dark days of winter. Go back a little bit. We had planned, um, the district had planned to attend the Project Blueprint conference way back in January, and the theme at that time was teacher leadership. But you remember the big storms we had in January, we couldn't go. Just wanted you to know we're still taking the challenge of teacher leadership uh, very seriously across the district. Um, it's really a quotation from the person whose work was driving the business of the Project Blueprint activities in Wisconsin. 
uh, the, our lesson is clear, Linda Lampard says. Instructional leadership must be a shared community undertaking. Leadership is the professional work of everyone in the school. So the next activity I'm telling you about, I think, is a good example of that. You've heard a lot from me and from Kelly Hassan and other people about the writing program that we embarked on to refocus our efforts teacher by teacher and a lot of nuts and bolts. A couple of months ago, we uh, decided to do what we call an instructional walkthrough to look at our writing program. Those of you who have been on the board for a couple of years might remember the climate walkthrough we did, is it two years ago? Yes, we, and it was more um, interpersonal relations. We had help from other schools in the area to come interview kids and teachers outside of the classroom. This time at Pond Cove, what we wanted to do was get a, a day in the life picture of what writer's workshop looks like at Pond Cove. So uh, with 31 teachers, all presumably teaching writing, we uh, assembled a team, mostly team leaders. We had uh, somebody from each grade level, from allied arts, from special ed uh, pupil service team, and uh, Sarah Simmons. If I had been a little brighter and more on, on my game, I would have invited Nancy and the middle school teachers to come too, but maybe next time we do that. We took this um, project back to the faculty meeting and asked, what would we look for? We said we're changing writing, we're teaching writing in a certain way. So we came up with, you're gonna love the word, because it's LAS related, rubrics of what this should look like. We started our day in Sarah Simmons' room and uh, tried to at least be in pairs and visited all 31 classrooms during the day with our guidelines in hand, talked to teachers and talked to kids about the writing program. At the end of the day, we reassembled, um, shared our notes and insights and prepared a, a draft report for the uh, staff the following week. You know, besides confirming a lot of good things going on in the uh, writing program, the, the teachers who participated we're just really pleased to be able to take the day during school to be able to go out and see their colleagues at work and report back on the writing program and its successes. And for me, it was quite different. Um, although we've done lesson study and I observe a lot, this was a chance for me to involve a lot more people looking at the program in school. And I have to report back to you that the most striking thing, and this is related to the climate, was uh, how those mini lessons and nuts and bolts came alive because of the relationships that each teacher had with all kids in the room. It was just remarkable to me, I should have filmed it, to see how contact was made, how this new writing program draws out the best in the kids because of the personal contact with the teachers. We've always been on the edge of doing this, but we would hear from kids, I don't know what to write, can you help me? But this, you could see them light up during the lessons and when the teachers went around and conferred with them, to show that personal interest in what each kid had to say that the whole program took off. Th that to me is, is the critical thing. I love the curriculum we have, but without the teachers and the relationships with those students, it will not work. So they, uh, we got a lot of good feedback uh, about it, we reported back to the staff, it was very informative, affirmative, and we uh, would like to try it again sometime, maybe in a, a different subject matter. Also, more recently, we finally uh, straightened out the little tef technical difficulties with our new room that we, use, we can use to observe reading recovery lessons. We have a little problem with the microphone, you might have heard. But today, just in time, with all those worked out, Becky Swift did a, uh, a live reading recovery lesson with one of her students. The other two reading recovery teachers, the whole first grade team, and Kelly Hassan sat behind that one-way mirror with the microphone working, and because they had some clamp, uh, common planning time, they were able to do this. They watched the lesson, of course the child didn't know, then debriefed the little lesson, asked questions about the uh, pace of the lesson, why certain decisions were made a certain way, uh, could have been in any, any different. And again, I was very impressed with the next step they took. There was a conversation about what would this look like in the classroom? I'm working with 18 to 20 kids, what can I extract from this one-on-one -on -one lesson that would make a difference in the classroom. So there were eight or nine or 10 people and they're engaged in this uh, deep professional learning on the spot. Unfortunately, the period ended because Allied Arts was over, but I think it was an extremely worthwhile activity. And just one more follow-up. Um, oh, incidentally, in reading recovery, I hear we're gonna get a letter from the commissioner soon. I don't know if you've gotten it yet, Bob, uh, with good news about reestablishing the network. So. The, our plan to fund the network through the, the idea funds, I think will really work. 
And a follow-up on a report I made way back when about the teacher assistance team and the good work they're doing. We've also been trying to follow Jeff's lead. You know, I think he's done a remarkable job with the Achievement Center and how that's going to help kids uh, meet our standards here. I, we think that our teacher assistance team, or TAT, will be the heart and soul of our effort to do that, particularly in light of the major changes with the special ed regulations, which I think will, will be enlightening. Of The new philosophy seems to be, even from Washington, don't let kids fail before you help them. Let's help them before they fail. So uh, TAT, which is getting stronger every year with that professionalism and your financial support, I think will be the, the key to that. And uh, looping things on in like reading recovery will make this whole thing be easier for the middle school and for the high school. If you have any really technical questions, I think you ought to save them for next month when the principal for a day is here. I'm sure she can feel that. No, I'd be happy to answer any questions. You know. I have a question um, in regards to Pond Cove. Um, where are we as far as the uh, teacher leader position that Kelly has currently, and what are the plans um, for the next year? We, we've talked about it a lot, um, Kelly and I have, about how the, the original plan, which was to have it be a cycle of uh, the teacher being uh, besides being a teacher in the classroom, being a more formal part. And the original plan was for two years, but when we uh, I think we used the model of uh, ready, fire, aim. We were ready and we fired, <laughs> and now we're starting to aim it more. So we thought it would be a good idea to keep it the way it is for one year more. And then, because it is, it's kind of a new thing, get feedback from people about how it's working, what changes they propose, and use next year, too, to um, recruit someone else to be in the job and, you, and do the same cycle. But uh, two years. Two years was a nice try, but with everything going on in the beginning, it, it seems like a year to me now. It's actually, next year will be the third year. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Tom? Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Keith and Sue, um, sports done right. I'm going to start, and then um, Keith's going to pretty much um, tell you what's, what um, the middle school and the high school does uh, to align themselves with the philosophy of, of the sports done right. More and more often, school boards and superintendents find themselves embroiled in a sports-related controversy. Uh, sports done right is a call to action on behalf of Maine student athletes. This was a University of Maine initiative uh, funded by a congressional allocation through the office of uh, Senator Susan Collins. And the committee was co-chaired by Duke Albany's former education commissioner and Robert Cobb, uh, dean of UMaine College of Education. A select panel um, was selected. It included coaches, superintendents, athletic directors, um, Olympic gold medalist Joan Benoit Samuelson, um, representatives from the MPA, medical professionals, and the student athletes themselves. These folks developed the standards for people to consider and endorse through compacts. Um, Sports Done Right is centered on seven core principles supporting core practices that describe what healthy sports programs look like. The report also red flags out-of-bound situations, such as troubled trends, negative behaviors, and policies that need to be eliminated. High-quality athletic programs are built upon a foundation of strong leadership, clear policies, um, adequate resources, and effective organization. Our recreation programs, including travel basketball teams and lacrosse, support the philosophy of the core principles and practices of the sports and learning. Programs should foster fun and learning where athletes are coached in a fair and patient manner. Community services supports and provi provides for only the in-season sports. The town and the school use of facility policy gives priority use to only in-season sports. Out-of-season sports go to the bottom of the list and are assessed rental fees, custodial fees when applicable, and most of these organizations must obtain their own insurance to use our facilities. 
other out of school programs such as elite and select teams are not aligned with the core principles and they seem to focus on developing division one college athletes or even those um, striving to reach the Olympic level. The concerns established in this report state that too much travel, too many practices, and year-round play may not be in the best interest of student athletes. This report involves surveying over 300 student athletes who, were, who called for better communication between athletes, coaches, and parents, um, put more fun back into sports, keeping winning, in perspective and asking for fair and equal treatment of athletes regardless of, of the athlete's ability. Students also identified practices that are detrimental to the healthy sports, um, to the healthy sport experience. Negative comments by parents and fans, win at all costs attitudes and coaches favoring the best players. Parents need to release their children or child to the game and not live their own athletic dreams through their children. The red flag for parents taking it too seriously include being nervous before his or her, her, his or her child's game, has a difficult time bouncing back when the team loses, makes notes so that they can give feedback and advice at the end of the game, and most often becomes verb, verb, ver, verbally excuse me, critical of the coach, the officials, and of the child's performance. This report has developed standards for communities and schools to consider towards making positive changes and chosen behaviors in sports that long range will benefit everyone connected to the athletic programs. I think Cape Elizabeth shares and already demonst demonstrates the sports done right philosophy. Keith will speak to how the middle school and the high school programs align with those core principles. And uh, before Keith does that, um, I have for your perusal um, what we do in orienting our travel team coaches so that they fully understand our perspective and what our expectations are in terms of um, playing time, how the athletes treated, um, how the athletes represent Cape Elizabeth. So um, I'm just going to leave these with you and um, <coughs> have any questions regarding them, feel free to, um, you know, give me a call. Well, as Sue mentioned, one of the things that uh, we found out as a result of this uh, conference was that Cape Elizabeth does sports right. Um, three years ago, uh, an extensive, um, I, want, I want to say survey and so forth, was done in a panel, it's not necessarily a panel, but a group made up of coaches, uh, administrators, uh, parents, students, and, and uh, athletes. We did an extensive uh, survey on the athletic programs at the high school and middle school at Cape Elizabeth. Um, we came back, uh, there were three different groups came back and uh, reviewed all the policies involved with athletics, uh, reviewed the, the whole area with coaching and everything. I know Andy was part of that, I think Jeff was part of that as well. Uh, I know Sue was involved in it. And uh, as a result of that work that was done three years ago, uh, when this presentation was done here on, on Sports Done Right, every time we came to a different section, all I could think of was, well, we do those things, those things that we do here in Cape Elizabeth already. Uh, and particularly in the area of the middle school, uh, we, we do not cut any kids from any of our programs. We try to provide uh, an activity for anybody who might be interested in that activity. We try to provide some form of competition for them. We do not care about winning. We care that everybody gets a chance to, to participate. Uh, at the, one of the things that we have done at that level is we have eliminated all our championships. Uh, we formed a, a new league, or I shouldn't say new league, but our league took over the, our the sport of swimming. And one of the things we did at the end of that season this year was not have a championship meet, but <coughs> we had a relay kind of for boys and girls, and we had it here at Cape Elizabeth, and it was a, a real success. The kids absolutely love that. Uh, and that's one of the things that's brought out in this report about the emphasis on winning, particularly at the younger level. 
Um, we have found that uh, many of our kids uh, already, uh, a lot of stress is put on them and winning in their U10, U12s, U14 soccer programs, AU basketball, uh, youth hockey, uh, all these different areas. And, uh, and that was one of the things that came out of this report is way too much emphasis is put on that, particularly by parents at that level. And so we have tried to eliminate all of that uh, at the middle school level. And the same thing at the high school level. I, I, I could not tell you what the record is for a JV freshman or any of those teams. Uh, and in all those programs, everybody gets a chance to participate as well. We try to do whatever we can to have the most participation for all our kids. And I think it, it, it's borne out by the fact of the huge numbers that we have who participate in all our activities. Um, uh, this, uh, having a field not available to us this uh, spring is just, uh, I mean, with all the kids that we have participating, uh, creates headaches every day. Uh, Sarah Kinsella was involved with the Girls Across program, and we have uh, high school girls across, middle school girls across, the high school boys and girls track, and middle school boys and girls track, all using one area down there. So trying to schedule that every day with well over 200 kids in just those programs uh, is a good problem, but, uh, but it still is a problem and hopefully we'll, we'll take care of in a couple of years. But again, just to just let you know, what we found here, and I think Sue will agree, is that what we do here in Cape Elizabeth is what other communities are looking at and are trying to do. Um, a couple of important things that Sue mentioned, a couple of statistics, particularly as Sue mentioned, they're dealing with the parents. Um, in, in these surveys that Sue mentioned, 59% of high school football and basketball players believe they will receive a college scholarship. One percent of high school athletes will receive a Division I athletic scholarship. Out of 13,000 high school athletes, 12,999 will never be a professional athlete. In other words, one out of every 13,000 will be a professional athlete. And I think as soon as parents realize that uh, athletics is not the means for a college scholarship or to become a professional athlete, uh, we will have made the athletic program even better than it is. Are there any questions that Sue or I might mention? I might uh, try to answer for you. Um, I want to thank you for presenting that information and I think I'll be very honest, when I first started working on the school board, I thought that um, at the school level we had some issues with the level of competitiveness, but over the year with various conversations with other members and other um, members of the, the, the town itself, um, it does seem more of an issue that does fall outside of school sanctioned sports. And we as a school board can say, okay, I guess it's out of our hands, we're done talking about it. Or we can say, um, what, what is happening here? Why at such a young age, six years old, seven years old, are parents enrolling their kids in non-school, private, I would guess you would say, club sports, um, and continuing, th continuing that through the elementary school grades and the early middle school grades um, on weekends and et cetera, taking Sundays and Saturdays. Um, and how does that impact the later school um, athletic experience of these students? Um, I, I personally would like to have that conversation. I, I um, through conversation with Elaine, I'm aware of that really good work that you guys did three years ago that you also mentioned. Um, but it, it, what it doesn't address is the, more, the cultural issue, I think, that we see here. And even though you say you can't um, cite any records of the JV um, teams or whatever, if you happen to notice in the high school rep report from our students, a number of times it was referred to undefeated, undefeated. Very I proud... The last teams he was talking about. Mm -hmm. I think you might have been talking about the vast. Yes, no, I understand. So at the JV level, we, yeah. understandably, you're not 
perhaps reaching that high level of performance, but there is a clear, strong, proud tradition here in Cape Elizabeth in our undefeated teams. And so what does that say to our students who, are tr who would like to play the sport but maybe aren't quite at that level? Geez, maybe I need to enroll in that club sport on the, you know, in the middle of the winter even though it's a spring sport, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I just would urge us to continue to have this conversation um, and maybe take it to the, to the community at large, maybe bring Sports Done Right, to, to bring the parents in and other town citizens to open this up beyond the school sanctioned sports, but to include the, the families. No, I, I would agree with you that, that the area that Sue and I are able to control are, uh, is the area where, where we think we do do things right. Uh, and, and you know, there's only so much time, so, but I do agree with you. I mean, the, the, the things that are done outside the, the, the school program, what they call in, in, the pro, in their report the out of school sports, are where there are real problems. There's no question about it. And, and, and it would have to be something that the community as, and us as a whole would have to be involved in. You're absolutely right. Well, I think it's important to note, too, that um, some of those out of school sports have been brought under the umbrella of community right. services. Right. Sue, you can speak to that. Um, I know that um, travel basketball, travel lacrosse, um, more and more recreation departments are taking it under their umbrellas so that we have some control about philosophy and um, not cutting kids and everyone plays equally and has the opportunity to try new positions. Um, I went to a girls lacrosse meeting for travel lacrosse in Cumberland a couple of weeks ago and only two recreation departments were sponsoring the teams. The rest were sponsored by parent-driven organizations and I was appalled at some of the comments they made. For instance, we're talking about fifth and sixth grade girls who are just learning to play the game of lacrosse. And one coach said, well, we certainly need to have paid officials because my kids were uncomfortable having the coach of the other team referee the game. And I went, they're just learning to catch and throw the ball. Um, you know, and I, I was really appalled. I mean, I thought, here, what are we getting ourselves into competing in this league where you know, they're concerned about um, what the call is. Never mind just keeping the game safe, is, which is what their function should be out there. But that's the difference between something sponsored by your recreation department with a certain philosophy and those elite, you know, programs that are being orchestrated by parent groups. So we're doing everything we can, and I think other communities are trying to do likewise. Well, I read the whole report. I thought it was really, it was very interesting. And as I was reading it, having kids who have participated for years and years in sports, um, I mean, you know, I read it and pretty, really pretty much thought, wow, I think we do a pretty good job, um, you know, with the bulk of this. But, but I guess I would, you know, challenge ourselves to sort of look at this with maybe, you know, scrutinize a little bit more and just say, you know, this is such a great report, it's such a great opportunity to really, really carefully examine our practices. And so the four of you who went to the presentation, you know, you must be having some thoughts about, well, you know, maybe we could, you know, do a little bit more work in this, maybe we could focus on this little bit in the upcoming years. I mean, so I'd like to, you know, instead of just kind of shelf it and... Oh, uh, we haven't shelved it. Right, so I guess I'm asking, in what way have all of you thought about how to keep this alive, given that we do do, you know, a really good job, um, but how can we, we keep it in the forefront? I think one of the things we need to do is we need to work with those, those parent groups that are running programs in Cape Elizabeth, um, such as Casco Bay Soccer, and I do work with them, and I think they have a great perspective. Anyone who wants to join, joins and it's a matter of everybody playing, everybody being put on a team, and the only thing they do is they play more games, and certainly if kids want to take it to that level and that commitment, I think it's fine that they do that, so long as they keep things in perspective. But I also think that, you know, playing at that young age um, also runs the risk of having kids being burnt out um, from playing that particular sport, because if you listen to these people that that come and speak, 
they're saying that a good athlete, regardless of whether they're in every single feeder system, they sometime, once they start to be involved, are going to catch up. Any other? Yeah, Lane? I'd like to just um, talk a little bit about what the report says about um, attracting and keeping good coaches. Um, and I know that's been a challenge over the years, um, and we've tried to kind of set up a, a way to to attract some of them, and we even have gone in, in certain directions where we've had coaches who have been um, coaching two sports at one time. They may be parents. They're, we're really moving away from the idea, ideal uh, situation where teachers who work with kids were our coaches that we remember. And so I guess one of the challenges that I would like us to take a look at is, you know, how do we attract these coaches for our kids, which is such an integral part of the people that they become, um, rather than the turnover? Well, one way is, if, if possible, in, in hiring teachers, if, if, if you know, we, we do look at those people who are involved in coaching. I mean, we, we just had Andy and Sarah up here, and they're two outstanding coaches and, who are teachers. And uh, I mean, one of the things that's happened over the years is the number of coaches who teach has decreased drastically, and so the only place you can go is, is to go outside the field of education, and, and that tends to be where we have the most problems. And you can, I mean, we, we stress the fact that athletics is an extension of the classroom, and, uh, and, and when we have people who coach who aren't teachers, um, that's when we have the most difficulty. Fortunately, that so many of our coaches uh, happen to teach in other school districts, which is beneficial to us also. I noticed that. Uh, our boys hockey coach, who was just named coach of the year, actually teaches at Massabesa and drives up here every day for our for our practices. So it, it, it's a it's a continuing problem. Uh, uh, I know that in the case of the high school, and the, whenever Jeff is looking at teachers, I I always ask him if any of the people they're looking at happen to coach, you know, as well. So just so they keep that in the back of their mind. Yeah, Keith, correct me if I'm wrong, but I I think almost every one of the coaches that we're appointing tonight were the only applicant for the position. Uh, and in fact, that's correct. why we're so late, because um, they were the only applicant that we could, we could find. And this is not, un this is not uncommon. No. And, um, and that's after, inter uh, uh, after advertising, advertising after, and... After, you know, recruiting, after going after them in many different ways. And, um, you know, one thing that is going to happen, we are going to have a change, I think, uh, somewhere near 30% um, of our faculty is, or 40% is probably 50 or over at this point. And we are going to see a turnover in faculty. And I think that is a place that you need to look um, because that is about the only way it's going to, going to work. But, but maybe the, the, based on that, that consideration and the difficulty we have, um, if we are going to be hiring more and more coaches outside of our school system, um, maybe perhaps we need to look at how we can help them become successful so that they'll stay. Um, I don't know whether it's pay, I don't know whether it's professional training, whether it's goal setting and evaluation or, or whatever, um, but perhaps that's the direction we need to, to take so that we can support athletics the way the community wants it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, one of the things Keith and I were talking about today was just training of coaches. Every coach in our system in their first year with us gets um, first aid, CPR, and athletic coaching courses and must take those. Not a, not a, a choice, must take them. But, you know, uh, there again, um, people who have jobs in other places, a lot of times the job comes first when it comes down to can I continue to coach or not. What? I, I just can't let this quite go yet. <laughs> um, I know that you know we've had guest speakers come into the community and talk about sports. Um, I know that um, we tend to get a lot of parents who who do come out. Whether we we, we did a forum on on uh, when we first thought we were going to initiate athletic fees. Um, there seems to be a strong interest, and in, and I'm wondering whether we would consider holding a school board workshop. Or, or something along that line come the fall. Um, 
where we could ask the community their feelings on competitiveness, their feelings on some of our philosophies, um, and do a little bit more publicizing in regards to, and perhaps, you know, letting people know we're, we're heading in the right direction. Um, and how right, I mean, that would be a great opportunity to sort of, to show what a good job our community is doing. I mean, we could use this as sort of a jumping off point and saying, wow, this is this whole, you know, project that's been done and looking at our own community and comparing ourselves to this, I mean, that's a really good message to put out there yeah. to people. Um, and, and that might get people thinking about all the club sports and... Um, but, it, in, you know, as you say, not, not to file this away somewhere, and I know that Keith and Sue and, you know, our phys ed teachers and stuff like that and coaches will look at it, but to bring the community into it a little bit, mm -hmm. I think we could benefit. Um, that could be a good idea. Um, As you mentioned, I think uh, we had, uh, Bob Branham, I think he came and spoke to all the coaches and so forth. It was a terrific message. That, yes. That, uh, I mean, it was really good. I didn't see where it changed a whole lot of what happens at those uh, youth programs. But, I still felt like we were on the, that compared to other communities yeah. in their youth sports, that we still fared pretty well to what his message tried to convey. So then is that something that maybe we could think about doing, that we would want to think about doing in the, you know, next fall or? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think we will. I think we'll put Sue in charge of that and we'll be all set. I was looking for a while. Well, you know, I, I, I know we have an athletic steering committee. Yep. Um, and, you know, maybe this is an opportunity um, to let that committee come up with some ideas uh, on uh, where to go with it. I will also add it to Alan's to-do list or, yeah. or to, you know, to be thinking about. You know, representatives of this group did come down and do a workshop at South Portland and they oh. invited parents yep. and um, not everybody agrees with it. Yes. yes oh, right. I did see that. <laughs> yep. that mm -hmm. up, yeah. Any other Thank questions? you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Keith. So, Lane, we'll have a discussion of your suggestion at some point soon. It's on my agenda now. <laughs> All right. Uh, into committee reports. Uh, Kathy, would you begin with a uh, finance subcommittee report? Yes. Um, the finance committee. Uh, of the board whole met this evening before this meeting at 7 o'clock. Um, we discussed uh, a school bus three-year lease which comes on later on in the agenda. So I'll leave that alone for now. We also reviewed the food service task force report which um, there's a couple of items um, as I paw through the papers here. First of all, the um, the negative student accounts are up $1,263 from last month. Um, however, there's some factors that are contributing to that. The over $40 list, and that is the um, accounts that have a negative $40 or more, is only up $338 with um, long-term accounts already having been sent out to the collection agencies. Um, and there's only two students on the over $40 list that are from February. All the other ones are new to the over $40 list, so uh, the point is that there's, um, there's a whole bunch of small overdrawn accounts, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, the Thomas Agency is currently working on $3,853 of um, over, over, overdrawn accounts that are older. Um, and we had a community service sign up um, for some camps uh, last week, and I know that there's going to be some other signups coming up. And just a reminder that if an account is overdrawn, $40 or more, um, students are not eligible to sign up for community service programs until that account is brought up to date. And I believe also that Bob is going to be sending out or, or looking at sending out another reminder to uh, all student accounts just to remind folks about 
what our policy is in terms of being overdrawn. Um, did I miss something, Bob, on that? Okay. Um, we also went over the Pond Cove construction update. Uh, I'm not sure that there's anything, maybe Bob, you want to address that or? Well, only that uh, um, we are coming down to the end. Um, we have a few things to finish up, particularly outside work that couldn't be done until uh, the snow's gone away and, and some reseeding and other um, spreading out the uh, chips and those kinds of things. But we are anticipating being someplace in the neighborhood of $130,000 to the good um, at the end of that project, and we'll be referring that back to the to the uh, building committee um, for recommendations to go to the town council. Thank you. And other than that, we reviewed appropriations reports and signed warrants. And I believe that was it for this evening. Questions? And policy. The policy committee met on April 5th. Um, the first item of, um, of new business was a presentation by two high school members who are also um, uh, student advisory committee members, Mary Cox and Corinne Earnshaw, who wanted to um, present some suggested revisions to the substance abuse policy. Um, apparently, the SAC has been working on revising this and considering what they think has been working over the last couple of years, what the student group thinks might be um, some good changes to the policy. They presented those and what the policy committee, our process has always been is when somebody would like to request a policy review or a revision consideration, they come to the committee and then we hear what what they're thinking about and then we decide how to proceed from there. And what the committee did decide is that we would like to take a look at the policy. Um, and because it's a policy that affects you know, so many students and families so directly and because it has been two years since the existing policy has had um, you know, revisions, we decided that we are going to recommend later this evening that we form a um, an advisory committee, a substance abuse policy review advisory committee um, that will work over the next year or so or however long it takes um, to look at, to review and to evaluate and then to possibly make recommendations on revisions to the existing policy and I believe that we'll be formalizing that later this evening. Under old business, um, the first item was policy IHCDA, which is post-secondary enrollment options, which <clears throat> has to do with students who take classes at local colleges for a variety of reasons. Jeff presented a rewrite to that um, policy, and there's just one other item that we're going to be looking at at our next meeting. Um, and that will be presented when we have done the bulk of the I policies, which is instruction those will all be presented for consideration. Uh, the second item under old business was policy IKB, which is our homework policy. In looking at that, we discussed that um, what's reflected in there, the, the overall philosophy may, may in fact um, hold true for what we feel middle school and high school um, may feel good about, but perhaps may not reflect our philosophies for the elementary level. Um, we all, there are also attached guidelines and we feel that those definitely need to be updated and changed. Um, what we're going to be doing is to gather some sample policies and also look at current research in the area of homework. Look at those over the next couple of meetings and we talked about the possibility of holding a school board workshop or some kind of community forum on the whole homework uh, issue in the fall. <clears throat> we'll be working on that and letting people know what we decide to do with that. The third item under old business was policy IGA, curriculum development and adoption. 
and Bob had rewritten that policy go using suggestions that we had worked on in the previous meeting. That will also be presented under the I policies at a later date. Other business was that the school board members then um, convened to discuss the um, B policies, which are board governance, which we're slowly making our way through. And we will be presenting two policies later this evening, one for first reading and one for second reading. Thank you, Wayne. Communications Committee, Rebecca? Um, the Communications Committee is, it, it took a month off from meeting to allow the members to formulate more concretely communication committee goal strategies and we will be meeting in a couple of weeks to go over that and hopefully have something to present to the board in May. Thank you, Rebecca. Personnel committee. Um, the personnel committee has uh, completed its most significant task, um, which is uh, recruiting and retaining a new permanent superintendent. You all know about that, so I won't get into any detail. As chair of that committee, I want to thank everyone on the board as well as the, uh, uh, the various administrators and residents who were involved in this process. Um, again, thank you. Without your help, uh, I don't know where we'd be right now. The last thing in terms of personnel is that I am trying to establish a, an organizational meeting to review the status of personnel-related matters, um, to look at disconnecting negotiation committee from personnel, and there will also be a... Uh, a reorganization of the leadership of the personnel committee um, when that meeting is completed. That's it for the personnel committee. And our final report, I believe, is the volunteer advisory committee, who, which our representative to that committee is Trish Brigham. Um, the volunteer advisory committee is a district-wide committee um, led by Gail Schmader, who's a volunteer coordinator. And it includes administrators, parents, teachers, and a school board rep, myself, this year, um, and Bob, the superintendent as well, Bob Lyman was there. It meets annually to review the effectiveness and the results of the many volunteer programs we have, everything from parents and community members in the classrooms to high school student mentor program. Um, it includes the career day and the advertising that Gail does of the tangible needs of the school. As you might imagine, evidence of the PCPA grant, we, volunteerism is very high in Cape Elizabeth and it adds tremendous value to the system. Depending on the figures that you use to value a volunteer hour, um, the dollar value of you know, the, the volunteer effort we have ranges anywhere from an estimate of $139,000 to $370,000. The lower figure uses a minimum wage and the higher figure uses the United Way points of light um, figure. We we're fortunate to have such a high level of commitment. Um, and this year, one suggestion was made to sort of recognize the work that some of the volunteers are doing and to celebrate the work of the high school mentors who do a great job. They mentor some of the students at Pond Cove. Um, Gail is hosting, or the committee is hosting, a breakfast for those students at the high school on Wednesday, May 4th, from 7 to 7.30 in the morning, um, if anyone would like to attend that. But that's just a gr one of the many great programs that we have here. When is it again? Wednesday, May 4th, from 7 to 7.30 a.m. Primarily for the high school students. That's why it's in the high school cafeteria. Is that it, Trish? Yes. Thanks very much. Any other questions for Trish? Seeing none, we'll move on to unfinished business which is consideration of policy for second reading, BDE, board standing committees. Anne? Okay. Um, did everybody get the read? Oh. Take a package. Wood. There were a couple of typos. The names were changed and switched around and under the board advisory committees, there was a whole portion left off. So Mary's just redone those. 
Um, this is the this is second reading. We did look at this the last time. So the changes that were made from the last meeting, I'll just go over those before we move on this. We did change the name of the policy from board committees to board standing committees because um, now that we're going to have a policy on board advisory committees, we just thought it, you know, just made it a little bit clearer. Um, B, which was the item that uh, we had some discussion around last time that has been rewritten. And then H is a new item that we um, added to this. We thought that we wanted to have people consider the concept of term limits for our committees. So that really makes us kind of move things around. <clears throat> so I guess I'd like to make a motion um, that we accept this policy as presented to open up second discussion. Motion. Henry, thank you. Do we have a second? Henry, just Henry just seconded. Seconded. Oh. That's right. <sighs> I forgot you're allowed to do that. Henry has seconded. Um, comment, conversation, Kathy. Um, I know, I know that um, we talked about this before um, about the committee chair and the committee members being appointed by the school board chair. And I, do you remember? Um, was that discussed again? Because I, I know that I had brought up concern that. I understood that the committee chair would be appointed by the school board chair, but I thought, or at least I guess it's my opinion, that the committee members should be appointed by the newly appointed committee chair. I think one of the things that I think was confusing us the last time was that, number one, this had not been retyped because we had met that day. But anyway, I think we got talking about all of our committees in terms of you know, not only the board the board standing committees, but also the board advisory committees. And I th that was part of that discussion, wasn't it? But other people said, who appoints all the people on advisory committees? So we were kind of, that's, I think, where we were getting confused with that. So um, anyway, this is well, I mean, what we came up with. with that. Now, but the, but the advisory committees are done this, the way I just described. The, well, the board, I mean, if we want to talk about that now, which I think might no, be a little no. confusing. Well, no, but I'm, what I'm saying is, is that I thought you had just said, I'm, I'm not confused about the difference between the two. I'm saying that I think that the board standing committees should be done where the school board chair appoints the committee chair and the committee chair appoints the committee members. That's what okay. I think. That's the way I think it should be done, okay. not the way it's written, which is actually the way it's written also. Well, part of it's partially written by the board, as the board standing committees is written sort of like that. I don't want to confuse the issue. What I just said before I said that part. Okay, so what you're saying is you think that the school board chair should appoint the committee chair, and then the committee chair should appoint the other members of the standing committee. Yes. Any other comments or questions? I'd like to hear um, the reasoning behind the chair appoint, appointing committee members outside of the chair, in addition to the chair. I think part of it, and well, Kevin, I mean, you can sure. chime in. I mean, part of our discussion was that, that when we've had our organization meeting each year, that's you know kind of how it happened. It's, it's how it's been done. That, of course, doesn't mean that that's how it has to always, it doesn't have to stay that way. But, um. are, are there any other standing committees besides communication that has non-board members on it? Do we know? Well, but, but of course, the non-board members are not really, I mean, they're there in more of an advisory capacity on the communication committee. Not at our meetings. <laughs> I consider them equal to me. I mean, I, 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 we function as an, a committee of equals. Well, on the policy committee, we, ha you know, I mean, 
the administrators come to all of our meetings, but they're not they're not v voting members, so to speak, of of the committee. So it's the same. I mean, isn't that kind of the same thing? It's exactly the same thing. And having sat through both of those meetings, policy and communication, it is. They're just it, the discussion when it comes to voting. We, I mean, we haven't really taken any official votes per se in the communication committee. And I don't even know if we've really taken official well, votes on policy. Right, Everyone we, at the table is an equal discussion well, member. And that's what I'm saying. They're there so to advise. It's the same as policy. I mean, everyone sort of contributes regardless of what their official status is, it seems to be that they both contribute to the conversation. Well, I, I think this conversation highlights an area that needs probably some, some explanation to avoid any confusion. I mean, I, um, t just to make sure the committees are working similarly, and when you get new board members like myself who don't really know um, the, the role of board members voting and advisory members, and et cetera, et cetera, we might want to have some clarification. So, I mean, one thing might be to have a, a clause in here that says something that um, that there might be non-board members who attend standing committees um, in an advisory role. Or that would be helpful. To just point out that there are other people who... Yeah. I mean, that, that might be a good idea to clarify. That would be helpful. Yeah. It seems to me that the board chair has never appointed the non-board members of the policy committee. It's just a matter of practice that the administrators are there. In theory, if we didn't want to be collaborative, we wouldn't have to have the administrators there. We could just ignore them. Um, no, but I think it, the same goes to the communications committee. The issue is that the members of the committee do get appointed, but um, in the terms of the administrators and in terms of those people who volunteer <coughs> to serve on your committee, there is has not been to date um, a formal appointment process, which is going to be covered under board advisory committees. Um, for appointments, so whatever clarification anybody wants is fine with me. Yeah, I mean, if we're going to if we're going to have two different policies for two different types of committees, we need to be equally as clear in one as the other. I I think just to just to be complete. Right, and that's what the board advisory committee policy is for, because that's a new policy. Well, I, you know, one of the things, what Rebecca's saying, and I guess I sort of started to stumble in it before, but <clears throat> the board advisory committees, the composition of those is the members, the number of members, the composition of each advisory committee, and the selection of members will be determined by the board in consultation with the superintendent based upon the purpose of the committee. And that's what brings me back to the board standing committees and how those are com comprised and that was why I had that one of the reasons why I had that objection to that is that um, I think that the board's standing committees and the way they're put together is really more in co in, in is how they should be put together versus an appointment by of all committee members by just by the school board chair um, and and I'd like to see the committee chair have a, a more direct role in selecting committee members, whether they are board members or non-board members. I, I thought by definition somewhere, I could have read either it was MSMA or something, that a standing committee has to have only board members, official board members. You can have others in advisory capacity, so the committee chair couldn't appoint anyone who wasn't a school board member to serve on that committee. Yeah. And Kathy, under, if we want to now look at the board advisory committees, I mean, it's done the same. We're saying that the school board chair appoints all school board, all other school board representatives and appoints the chair. So that is the same. I mean, what's different is that we have other people who are on the board advisory committees. It's only school board members who are 
real members of a board standing committee. Now I hear what you're saying, and you're saying that you don't think that the school board chair should appoint anyone on a standing committee except for the chairperson. Right, and then I think the chairperson should then appoint the other <laughs> school board members to be on that committee. Because that person is going to be the one that they're directly working with those people. And I see that as being maybe key um, in that working relationship. Do other people agree with that? I've, I've never had a problem doing it the way we've done it before. I don't recall that we've anyone has had any objection, and it actually gives the, the chair the opportunity to rotate people through, um, especially if you've got newer members who are starting to chair um, and don't have the historical perspective of the board at hand. I, um, I mean, I can go either way. I don't think it's really that big a deal, to be honest with you. I mean, most of our committees are only two, three, three school board members. Two or three. Yeah, yeah two or three school board members. So I actually, I, now that I think about it, I stick with what we've done in the past. I, it hasn't, I think it works well. We have two different issues here. One is the issue of who appoints, and the other is the advisory members. Um, and um, if I'm looking at board standing committees, which is the one we're dealing with first, um, we may under B, where it says committee chair and committee members may, shall be appointed by the school board chair, we may want to add advisory members may be added, and we can just leave it at added, um, or we can be more specific about who adds them. I, I don't know that we have to do that. I mean, we could... Just to be, we could say non-school board. Advisory members? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe added. And does that give them full voting? No. 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 If it's advisory, there's no No, voting. but we just, wasn't that quote, wasn't that addition in a standing committee? Wasn't yeah. that in point B in the standing committee? So if you add advisory members, do you then need some clarification that when an official vote is taken, the vote is only... Trish, if they're advisory members, then they're advising only... So it's just semantic. We could, okay, so the, the, we could okay. say may be voted in a non-voting capacity. Okay. Maybe added may be what? Added. <laughs> added in a non-vote, what did I say? <laughs> may be voted in a non. Okay, may be added in a non-voting capacity. Mm -hmm. I know. I don't think that's really necessary. I mean, I think advisory means advisory. Well, if anybody's However, unclear about it, so would you? Somebody will wordsmith it. So can I then can I amend my motion to say I'd like to move that we accept this policy with the <clears throat> amendment to B. Um, I just would like some clarification on the, on the advisory <coughs> members um, and whether it's clear that the, at this point I think it's appropriate for the chair to recruit <laughs> advisory members rather than necessarily being appointed by the chair of the school board. So we might want to clarify that in some way. Okay, so advisory members may be added at the discretion of the committee chair? Yeah, that works for me. No. <laughs> what would you propose, Kevin? I would propose not to handcuff me in my current position or any future board chair of the school board. A standing committee is a standing committee is a standing committee and makes recommendations to the full board. Mm -hmm. All right? We can seek advice from anybody we want. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, there are no members of a standing committee other than school board members. Everyone else is in an advisory capacity. And I think uh, we might want some discretion in who we choose to be our advisors. And if we want to go into that level of detail on the policy, we probably should table it. <laughs> yeah. 
And I'm not suggesting we do want to go to that level. I think we're making a mountain out of a molehill. I have a separate opinion on advisory committees. This, this is not advisory committee. This is our committee. <coughs> well, so by not specifying who, I mean, it sort of just leaves it up, you know. It, it, right. I mean, Rebecca, are you comfortable with not specifying who recruits the non-voting, non-school board members, advisors? <coughs> Or if not, do we need, I mean, you know, because if, if we want to really continue discussing, I think we need to table it and take it back. Yeah, I guess I just don't see the harm in it, uh, but. Um, just give me one second, would you? Okay, well, while you're thinking, mm -hmm. are people, <clears throat> I mean, the, we still have the issue of the, what Kathy has brought up, and I. I'm going to call the question. Okay. And you can vote for it or against okay. it. Go ahead. All those in <laughs> favor of the motion, aye. Which, is that with the amendment? With no. the amendment. That's the motion that we're discussing, <clears throat> is it not? With, with the amendment of the, of the sentence being added regarding advisory members may be added. Non-school okay. board advisory okay. members may be added in non-voting capacity. Okay, you want to vote? Yeah, no, please. I, I didn't put my hand up. I vote for that. Yeah. <laughs> Motion carries 5-2. You forgot to say all opposed. <laughs> all opposed. I didn't have a chance to talk about the other one. <laughs> it's okay. It's allowed. We don't have that <laughs> 7 0 votes all the time. <sighs> On to new business. Consideration of the superintendent's recommendation to athletic fee positions, Bob. Yes, we have a number of these because spring sports are starting and we finally have people in those positions. We <coughs> mentioned it earlier. In your package were, were, were pieces of information on Evan Levada as freshman baseball coach, Sarah Haskell for JV girls lacrosse, um, Adam Waxman, <laughs> for assistant varsity baseball, Mike Ott for seventh grade boys lacrosse, Joe Doan for middle school spring track. And those are the recommendations. Now, I think we have another one in our addendum tonight. That's just more information about Mike Ott. And then there's another high school one as well. Yeah, That's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. Added to the list is uh, the name of Kurt Chapin for assistant varsity girls lacrosse at the high school. high school level. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendations for the uh, athletic fee positions. Second. Kathy. All in favor? I have a oh, I'm sorry. discussion. Con discussion item, yes. <laughs> Um, I, I just wanted to say, I, I know, I mean, we've had the discussion this evening about how difficult it is to get coaches and we advertise, we don't have anybody apply and so forth, but I just wondered if it would be possible. I just feel a little funny voting on coaches that have already begun working. And it seems, I, I'm wondering what the possibility would be to move up the time frame. I mean, it's not a new thing that we have a problem getting coaches. Um, and so I'm just wondering if we could move that up so that we're actually voting before these people have started working. Because it just seems, you know. Uh, we, we hear what you're saying, Ann. We would love to do that um, in 
I guess this is my 18th year as a superintendent, and I've never had all the coaches in place before <laughs> a season started because it was always a situation where we had to go out and recruit. Um, and I, I know that you know some people have concerns if it's um, a parent of one of the kids, but oftentimes that's the only person that's out who's out there who you can go. Well, no, I I know that it's hard to get coaches, and I'm not saying that it's going to make it any try. easier. You can try to I, make it earlier. It just seems. I mean, I guess maybe that's just not a not. Mr. Keith would like to have everybody in place before we. Yeah. We still have one position. We have a third. Okay, so well, that answers my question. Thanks. I guess it's just really not feasible to think that that's uh, possible. So. Keith, might I ask that you uh, trace one situation to the board? Um, just when the position became available and the steps that went into it that left. And oh, I don't. I'm not asking for you to do that tonight. Um, but if you could just toss us a handout at the next meeting, just so people have uh, a better concept of what's going into it and. Uh, then perhaps uh, having seen that, we might be able to make some uh, constructive suggestions. Any other uh, comments on the nominations? In that case, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? 7-0. Thank you. The next item is consideration of the 0506 calendar first review, and I'm not sure whether Ann's going to handle this or Bob's going to handle this. Neither are we. Oh. <laughs> well, take it away, Bob. All first right. One. Um, the calendar committee has um, uh, met, I guess, twice, mm -hmm. and um, also did surveys with teachers, surveys with parents. Um, brought lots of information into the, the process and has arrived at a, a draft calendar which is in the package tonight. Um, it has the, the important dates usually for people are when school's starting and we're looking at September 1st. Um, it's a Thursday. The staff would be starting on the 29th, 30th and 31st, some combination of those depending on which schools um, of August. Um, we would be continuing the practice of having um, two staff days, the beginning of Thanksgiving week and, and uh, the other three days as, as uh, off. Um, December vacation is the 23rd through, the 30, uh, through, through January 2nd. Um, February vacation is the week of February 20th. April vacation is the week of April 17th. And we would go to, instead of having late start days, we recognize the need to give teachers time to um, do work on assessments and their curriculum. And we would have one uh, early release day each month. It would be the second Wednesday of every month throughout the year um, for K through eight. Um, and so that would be um, basically a um, releasing uh, three hours before the normal release time. And that, again, would happen once a month, not um, every other week. Those are sort of the highlights. This calendar would have us um, the last day of school at the 14th of June with a days added as needed to make up for storm days next year. Did I miss pieces, Ann? I think that pretty much covers it. Um, we, we are sharing that so that people um, hopefully have a chance to get back to us before we vote on it next, next month. Um, the things people usually want to know at this time of the year are when are we starting school so that I can plan the summer for my family and kids? Um, when are vacation weeks? And um, are there going to be late start days or early release days or what's going to happen? So hopefully um, those things have tentatively been answered and we would go to a vote a month from now. Um, and this would be a draft. 
We've been careful about putting out a draft to the public because uh, last year a draft got out and we had people going by it and not sure as, as recently as, what was it, a week ago, Jeff, that high school, two weeks ago, kids weren't sure whether they had school or not on a certain day. So we're trying to avoid that problem too. So would you like questions by email then mm -hmm. on this? Okay. Absolutely. Um, email, uh, phone calls, if people have questions, please get them to us or have concerns. Well, we can ask questions. Oh, now, now yeah. Questions. No, I'm talking about people at home. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. But oh, questions exactly. now, sure. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what's the rationale behind um, starting school prior to Labor Day? I know in my prior um, work experience, a lot of people take that week off as vacation into the Labor Day weekend. And um, so I'm just wondering about the, you know, the rationale behind starting before Labor Day. Yeah. There were a couple reasons for it, Kathy. Um, one is that when, when we get out, the later you start, the later you get out. And, and this year we're pushing, I think, June 21st at this point. And people are concerned about going that late uh, in the year because certain summer things are starting, camps and whatever. Um, so there, there, there were concerns about that. Um, also, people found that starting kids on a Thursday you know, the high school usually starts only freshmen one day and everybody else comes in another day and that sets it up that it would be only freshmen one day, everybody's in for one day, and then they're really ready to get down to work. Everybody's been there for a day, so they're ready to get to work on that next uh, Tuesday when everybody comes in. Um, there were several different comments around the table. I think we had a 10-member committee in wasn't it? Yeah. Um, that um, worked on this. And it, it was um, the, the issue of starting on September 1st with students um, greatly outweighed the draft, the, an earlier draft, where we were starting students on the 6th. And uh, so that was, you know, really a, a majority of feeling of the committee. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. Are we treating this tonight as a first reading? Mm -hmm. When do we anticipate bringing this for a vote? Uh, the May meeting. Okay. Um, Bob, in March, you have two early release days, one on the 8th, one on the 30th. Why is the 30th on a Thursday and not a Wednesday? That's parent call. Parent call. Oh. It's a parent conference day for for, uh, um, Is that for on the K through eight, through eight. and Third. that is not a day that teachers are are doing working on curriculum. That's a day for parents <coughs> to have parent conferences. Okay. I think that's the only other early release day. But they, it shouldn't There's be. There's another it should be one conference in, in the fall and October. October 27th mm. is also an early release. That happens to be K through 12 um, because it's an early release and then the day after is parent conferences as well. Um, that's been tradition as I understand it um, that those are typically times when they're held. Um, in January, Mm -hmm. We have a um, teacher day on the 27th mm -hmm. and a early release on the 11th. Is, is there any reason why we couldn't switch it to the teacher day on the 13th and an early release on like the 25th? That way allowing... Well, the committee debated having all the early release days on Fridays and felt that... Um, if we're really here to give kids an education, a number of kids will not show up if it's an early release day on Friday. No, that, that wasn't my question, actually. Well, that, that came, comes down to the other piece that came into it was trying to be consistent. What we heard a lot this year was, wait a minute, it's not even every other week that we have these late starts. It's sort of scattered. And so that's why we went to Wednesdays, first of all, and then a consistent Wednesday every month, the second Wednesday of every month, so that people would know that it was a consistent time. Okay. 
Anything else on the calendar? Have we been have we been advertising that this work is being done in like in the Pond Cove newsletter and other newsletters so p people can participate? Yeah. Well, we I mean we well, sent out a survey. Oh, the surveys went out. We okay. sent out a survey. To yeah. How was the response? Went out several ways. It was great. We had Yeah, I mean we had huge response. I think we had almost 200 responses from parents. We had 66 responses from staff. Right. Okay. Um, and then some others trickled in there. So, um, so I mean, it was close to 300 responses. Mm -hmm. So I think that the word really got out in a variety of ways, mm -hmm. electronically, in Tom's newsletter. There was ample opportunity. And actually, I wanted to thank the community, the parents, for responding so quickly. I mean, we got those 160 responses back in like two days. I mean, yep. they had to go home in backpacks, get to the parents. The parents had to fill them out, get them back in the backpacks. The teachers had to get them. I mean, there's like seven steps involved. And Although other people picked it up people. on the website and uh, yeah. got back to us, and it was, it was well done. But I mean, it was a really fast turnaround, and people really participated. So I think that I feel that... This, you know, was a uh, a great uh, show of support for the process. Great. Probably should table it. Well, it isn't listed as a first first reading. It's listed as well. It's called first review. So I guess we're okay. Yeah. In any event, I'd like to urge everyone to get those cards, letters, and emails into us with their comments on the calendar as proposed. Um, certainly, we'll be watching with interest. So, is this draft on the website that people can go look at, or how do they get a copy of this, Bob, if, if they want to look at it besides just listening to us? Um, what we'll do is we will put um, the, the key dates. You know when they're going to be early releases, when their vacations are, and when starting and ending are, on as opposed to putting out an actual calendar at this point. Yeah, and just, you know, we'll get it on the website. Comments, you know, people yeah. might say, "Well, what was that date again?" or whatever. So that'd be great. Thanks. Okay, we're going to move on to our next item of business, which is consideration of a request from a teacher for a one-year leave of absence for child rearing. Bob, would you give us the details on that? Yeah, in your package is a uh, is a letter from uh, Julie Robbins um, explaining her reasons for asking for for the leave. Um, um, she has two young children and um, would like to spend some time with them. And um, I don't believe there are any issues from the school. Um, and do recommend that we grant this leave. Can I have a motion? I move that we um, approve Julie Robbins' leave uh, request for a leave of absence for child wearing for next year. A second. Elaine, thank you. Questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Next item is consideration of request for Cape Elizabeth baseball trip to Cape Cod, April 18th through the 20th. Bob? Yes, um, this was a request we had just before our, our uh, special meeting, the last special meeting. I tried to distribute it to everyone at that point. Um, it is to uh, Harwich, Massachusetts on Cape Cod <coughs> for three days. Um, I, I, you had it in your package. I think it's been done before, and again, I don't find any issues with it. Um, I just, yes. I just have one question. Um, we saw this for the baseball team, and I heard them mention that the tennis team is is heading down. Too. We we never saw. That's not the tennis team. Those are, those are the individual people who go down and play. It's not. Not school. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. All right. You mean you couldn't sign us up for that one? I know. Sure. Can I? <laughs> <laughs> and where is it, the tennis people? Uh, it's Hilton Head is what I heard them say uh, in their report. Uh, yeah, it is a good time of year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> Certainly better than August. Yeah. Um, can I have a motion? 
for the baseball trip? Elaine? Uh, I move that we approve the uh, athletic trip request for the Cape Elizabeth baseball team um, for uh, going to Harwich, Massachusetts, April 18th, 19th, 20th. Second. Second. Henry? Any, any further comment or question? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Next item uh, is consideration of policies for first reading BDF Board Advisory Committees. Ann, would you take that, please? Okay, this is a new policy. We don't have currently, do not have one in place on Board Advisory Committees. Um, we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. This is, um, of course, different than the board standing committees. Um, let me just read sort of this first thing so that people watching will know what this policy is about. The school board may establish advisory committees to perform specific functions. Advisory committees may study particular problems or issues and make recommendations to the board, but may not act for the board. So that's basically what it's about. I mean, it's a two-page policy. I won't read the whole thing, but um, that's, we need to open it up for questions, thoughts. This is just a first reading. May I suggest you read the second paragraph as well? Okay. Advisory committees may include individuals who are not elected members of the board, but each advisory committee shall have at least one board representative. Thank you. Example, oh, I'm just going to say examples of advisory committees that we've had this year. We've, um, the allergy task force that we put together would come under this policy, um, the substance abuse policy review subcommittee would be guided by this policy. So those are the kinds of things that we're currently doing that this would refer to. This is a first reading, so the, uh, we don't need a motion and a second in order to discuss this matter. It's just one typo, that's all. Okay. Where is it? It was a... Oh, board? Yes. Board. But just... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else? Come. So sure. people are okay with this, just as, as is? Okay. I think it's good work. Thank you. And if anything comes to mind between now and our next meeting, there is a policy committee, and uh, please inform Ann of any questions, concerns that you might have with the policy. Thank you. Let's move on. Um, consideration of a proposed three-year lease for a new bus. Kathy, if you would take that and incorporate all the verbiage by <laughs> reference rather than read the entire... Uh, you don't want me to read the whole thing? <laughs> uh, no, we have a board member who needs to leave in five minutes. <laughs> That's no fun. I like reading the long ones. Um, I would like to move that the superintendent of school be authorized to execute and deliver a tax-exempt lease purchase agreement with Gorham Leasing Group on behalf of the town of Cape Elizabeth for the purchase um, of a school bus um, and the purchase price being $67,520. How's that for short? That's, I like that. In accordance with the language of the... Uh, the rest of the document that I'm not going to read. That's right. <laughs> I'll consider that a motion. Can I have a second? Trish, Trish thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed, 7-0. With public's knowledge, we did discuss this in the Finance Committee tonight, so yeah. it has been discussed. Ad nauseum. We discuss buses far too much. 
we should just buy them. Um, next item, consideration of the superintendent's nomination to a teaching position. Bob? Yes. Um, this is for a special education teacher for next year, uh, Morgan Burns. And would you like to talk to us just very quickly about this? <coughs> I'm losing my voice. Yeah, we were very excited. We had um, not a lot of candidates apply. I think we had a minimum of, uh, maximum of 12 candidates. However, we were looking for someone who had a real strong background in uh, teaching students with autism who could deliver ABA programming. Um, and we were very lucky to find somebody who has been trained at John Hopkins and will be able to meet our current needs at this point. So we're, the whole committee was extremely excited and um, she has told us she would accept the position. Ooh. Excellent. Can I have a motion, please? Elaine? I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation to hire Morgan Burns uh, as a special ed teacher at Pond Club Elementary. Thank you. A second? Kathy? Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? 7-0. Uh, last item, consideration of a request from speech and debate coaches for out-of-state trip with students. Again, in your package <clears throat> was a, a uh, memo from Gretchen McNulty, Matt Clemens, Hannah Jones, and Kevin McNulty. Um, I think it laid out the details of the trip. Um, and. Um, their fundraising activities um, to help defray the cost of the trip, um, and they're asking for permission to go. And I, first of all, congratulations to them for being at that level, but um, I, I certainly hope that you do approve that. Can I have a motion, please? Trish. I move that we approve the request for the speech and debate coaches, uh, request from the speech and debate coaches for an out-of-state uh, trip to the National Speech and Debate Tournament. Great. Second. Rebecca. Discussion. All those in favor? <laughs> Opposed? Motion moves 7-0. We now have, yes, I know. Um, Trish. Keep going. Okay. We have two items. Um, where's my stuff? Yeah. Have we done the spring? Yes, we did the first one. Okay. Uh, the next item that was added was consideration of a request to determine the composition of the Substance Abuse Review Committee. Um, This is a new process for us, so I'm going to uh, fake it. Um, the policy committee has requested a that a uh, an a, a substance abuse policy review advisory committee be formed, with the charge of to review, evaluate, and make recommendations on any revisions to the existing substance abuse policy, the, uh, the review advisory committee would report generally back to the policy committee. And that its membership be composed of two high school students, um, the high school social worker, a middle school guidance counselor, two school board members, two other staff, one high school, one middle school, and the community liaison officer. And yeah, I did. Um, and the athletic director, and two school board members. At least two school board members. At least two school board members. Okay. Um, can I have a motion? I move that we accept your recommendation for the composition of um, members of the Substance Abuse Policy Review Committee. Thank you. A second? Trish, thank you. All those in any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? And I now will take care of the school board membership of that committee. Trish, will you serve as chair? Yes. 
and Ann. Um, will you serve on that committee as well? Um, that puts at least two members of the uh, policy committee on there since this is reporting back to the policy committee. And if anyone else, any one other individual has a, uh, an interest, um, is there anyone else? I'd like to attend the meeting. Well, but you can do that regardless. Yeah. These are not intended to be closed meetings. Do you want to be a member? <laughs> we want you. <laughs> You'll invite me. <laughs> well, we're going to put your name down if you. <laughs> yeah, I, w I would love to be a member Great. if you would expand it to three. Anyone else? In that case, uh, Elaine Maloney is appointed as the third member of the committee, which now makes it a, uh, a committee that needs to post its activities. That's done. Thank you. Um, and then finally, 12J, consideration of the superintendent's recommendation of Larry Allen to fill the co-curricular fee position of musical director for the theater program. Um, it, attached in your package is a, a uh, memo from Jeff Shedd. Um, the second paragraph reads, on another note, Larry Allen's name should come before the board for nomination for musical director for the theater program if this is the year that position is funded, and it is the year it is funded. Um, he has held this position in the past, so there should be information in the personnel file. Um, this is a position that was not appointed earlier and should be. If you heard the kids mention tonight that they are right now getting ready mm -hmm. to do Damn Yankees, I think they have 60 uh, students involved or something like that. Um, so it would be for the musical director position. Can I have a motion? Trish? I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation to appoint Larry Allen to fill the co-curricular position, fee position of musical director for the theater program. Thank you. A second? Rebecca, thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-2. Before I go to the uh, meeting, I need to go back to the Substance Abuse Policy Review Advisory Committee. Um, we will leave in the good hands of our administrators the appointment of two high school students. Um, the middle school guidance council, we only have one social worker in the high school, correct? Okay, so that's a, essentially a done deal. Um, two other staff, one high school and one middle school, and I will leave it to the chair to contact the community liaison officer. So if you would get back to us, Jeff and Nancy, with those appointments. And finally, dates to remember. Yeah, yeah, uh, these we have a couple of meetings that are not school board specific meetings. Uh, the, the first is tomorrow night. The school town council school board budget meeting is tomorrow night, Wednesday, um, April 13th at 7:30 here in this room. Um, the school board town council meeting on the high school driveway access is now scheduled for the 25th at 7 o'clock. And the public comment period on budgets with the town council is also scheduled for the 25th at 7:30. Those are again um, town council meetings, but we're involved in them, and everybody should know about them. Thank you, Bob. Other meetings: school board workshop Tuesday, April 26th, high school library at 7 p.m. Looks like we don't have a topic. We'll have a topic. We'll have a topic. Uh, school Board Policy Subcommittee meeting Tuesday, May 3rd, 2005 at noon, William Jordan Conference Room. Finance Subcommittee meeting May 10th, 7 p.m., William H. Jordan Conference Room, followed by the regular school board meeting at 7.30 in Council Chambers. And again, presentation of school budget to Town Council Finance Committee tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. Do we have any public comment at this point? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Be well, everyone.